The Discourses of Epictetus Book 1, Chapter 2 How may a man preserve his proper character upon every occasion? To the rational being, only the irrational is unendurable, but the rational is endurable. Blows are not by nature unendurable. How so? Observe how. Lacedaemonians take a scourging once they have learned that it is rational. But is it not unendurable to be hanged? Hardly. At all events, whenever a man feels that it is rational, he goes and hangs himself. In short, if we observe, we shall find mankind distressed by nothing so much as by the irrational, and again attracted to nothing so much as to the irrational. Now it so happens that the rational and the irrational are different for different persons, precisely as good and evil in the profitable and unprofitable are different for different persons. It is for this reason, especially, that we need education, so as to learn how, in conformity with nature, to adapt to specific instances our preconceived idea of what is rational and what is irrational. But, for determining the rational and the irrational, we employ not only our estimates of the value of external things, but also the criterion of that which is in keeping with one's own character. For to one man it is reasonable to hold a chamber pot for another, since he considers only that, if he does not hold it, he will get a beating and will not get food. Whereas if he does hold it, nothing harsh or painful will be done to him. But some other man feels that it is not merely unendurable to hold such a pot himself, but even to tolerate another's doing so. If you ask me, then, Shall I hold the pot or not? I will tell you that to get food is of greater value than not to get it, and to be flayed is of greater detriment than not to be so. So, that if you measure your interests by these standards, go and hold the pot. Yes, but it would be unworthy of me. That is an additional consideration, which you, and not I, must introduce into the question. For you are the one that knows yourself, how much you are worth in your own eyes, and at what price you sell yourself. For different men sell themselves at different prices. Wherefore, when Florus was debating whether he should enter Nero's festival, so as to make some personal contributions to it, Agrippinus said to him, Enter. And when Florus asked, Why do you not enter yourself? He replied, I? Why? I do not even raise the question. For when a man once stoops to considerations of such questions, I mean to estimating the value of externals, and calculates them one by one, he comes very close to those who have forgotten their own proper character. Come, what is this you ask me? Is death or life preferable? I answer life. Pain or pleasure? I answer pleasure. But unless I take part in the tragedy, I shall be beheaded. Go then, and take a part. But I will not take a part. Why not? Because you regard yourself as but a single thread, because you regard yourself as but a single thread of all that go to make up the garment. What follows then? This, that you ought to take thought how you may resemble all other men, precisely as even the single thread wants to have no point of superiority in comparison with the other thread. But I want to be the red, that small and brilliant portion which causes the rest to appear comely and beautiful. Why then do you say to me, be like the majority of people, and if I do that, how shall I any longer be the red? This is what Helvidius Priscus also saw, and having seen, did. When Vespasian sent him word not to attend a meeting of the Senate, he answered, It is in your power not to allow me to be a member of the Senate, but so long as I am one, I must attend its meetings. Very well then, but when you attend, hold your peace. Do not ask me for my opinion, and I will hold my peace. But I must ask you your opinion, and I must answer what seems right to me. But if you speak, I shall put you to death. Well, when did I ever tell you I was immortal? You will do your part, and I mine. It is yours to put me to death, mine to die without a tremor. Yours to banish, mine to leave without sorrow. What good then did Priscus do, who was but a single individual? And what good does the red do the mantle? What else then that it stands are conspicuous in it as red? and is displayed as a goodly example to the rest. But had Caesar told another man in such circumstances not to attend the meetings of the Senate, he would have said, I thank you for excusing me. A man like that, Caesar would not even have tried to keep from attending, but would have known that he would either sit like a jug, 
or if he spoke, would say what he knew Caesar wanted said, and would pile up any amount more on top of it. In like manner, also a certain athlete acted, who was in danger of dying unless his private parts were amputated. His brother, and he was a philosopher, came to him and said, Well, brother, what are you going to do? Are we going to cut off this member and step forth once more into the gymnasium? He would not submit, but hardened his heart and died. And as someone asked, How did he do this, as an athlete or as a philosopher? As a man, replied Epictetus, and as a man who had been proclaimed at the Olympic Games and had striven in them, who had been at home in such places and had not merely been rubbed down with oil in Beto's wrestling school. But another would have had even his neck cut off if he could have lived without his neck. This is what we mean by regard for one's proper character, and such is its strength with those who in their deliberations habitually make it a personal contribution. Come then, Epictetus, shave off your beard. If I am a philosopher, I answer, I will not shave it off, but I will take off your neck. If that will do you any good, take it off. Someone inquired, How then shall each of us become aware of what is appropriate to his own character? How comes it, replied he, that when the lion charges, the bull alone is aware of his own prowess, and rushes forward to defend the whole herd? Or is it clear that with the profession of the prowess comes immediately the consciousness of it also? And so among us too, whoever has such prowess will not be unaware of it. Yet a bull does not become a bull all at once, any more than a man becomes noble. But a man must undergo a winter training. He must prepare himself and must not plunge recklessly into what is inappropriate for him. Only consider at what price you sell your freedom of will. If you must sell it, man, at least do not sell it cheap. But the great and preeminent deed, perhaps, befits others, Socrates and men of his stamp. Why then, pray, if we are endowed by nature for such greatness, do not all men, or many, become like him? What? Do all horses become swift? All dogs keen to follow the scent? What then? Because I have no natural gifts, shall I, on that account, give up my discipline? Far be it from me. Epictetus will not be better than Socrates, but if only I am not worse, that suffices me. For I shall not be a Milo either, and yet I do not neglect my body, nor a Croesus, and yet I do not neglect my property. Nor, in a word, is there any other field in which we give up the appropriate discipline merely from despair of attaining the highest.